Um, this, this talk is um, about one part of that overall long-term project because I did, I was looking at the impact of Europeans on the Barma forest but using sediment and fossil pollen analysis but because I needed to know a bit more about that I also did some modern pollen trapping and to know some more about that I had to look at the vegetation so um, today I'm going to talk about vegetation surveys that I did. Um, so the themes here, here I've put down um, long term, long term here for me means four years. Um, I, um, I, I sampled the, the vegetation seasonally, um, but what this allowed me to do was to look at the long term vegetation, its variability, look at it on a landscape scale um, to see what, what's happening, what the relationships are across sites. <coughs> in the forest um, and I also looked at what was driving this vegetation what sort of environmental conditions were needed and I, I suppose I, my brain went a bit lateral in this in this one as you'll see um, and then I suppose you can look at it to see what all these results mean for for science and for management because we're just adding to a larger and larger database and there seems to be a huge database here amongst people that goes back quite a long time So what did I do? I sampled the vegetation over four years, between 1995 and 1999, and this seems to fill in a bit of a gap that's around in the vegetation. I used 11 permanent sites. Um, the large um, survey sampling site that I used was because I was testing modern pollen transport theory methods that were devised in Europe to see how the vegetation, where the pollen was coming from within the vegetation. So that's why it's rather an unusual um, quadrat. I recorded species and species abundance. Um, and I used um, river flow data um, that I got from the Big Data Water Warehouse, whatever it's called, and BOM climate data. And it's all readily available these days. Um, I also used water quality from the river water quality data as well. And apart from just describing the vegetation, um, but you get quite a lot of information, but you really need to build on it. So I've looked at um, the similarities between the sites, the species diversity between the sites, and then I decided that wasn't enough either, so I did a multi-dimensional analysis um, to look at the, relation, the relationships in more detail, their strengths, and, and what directions they actually Act and, and then you can also look at the um, environmental variables that are driving all of that. Um, these are the sites that I used in Barma. Um, at Tongalong Ridge, I had two, two sites, <coughs> sites adjacent to each other, one inside the stock exclusion fence and one immediately outside the fence. Um, yeah, there were other stock exclusion sites because I used the, res the two research areas as well and one that I called Rose Swamp, which is just down near, um, I think, yeah, just along Tricky, what is the Tricky's track? Just through there. So those were the sites that I, all the sites that I used. Um, okay, my descriptive analysis. Um, as, as we've heard, variability, and it was variable between years, across seasons, between sites, at a site, you name it, it was variable. Um, I recorded from, from these 11 sites 235 species. Um, 152 of them only occurred once at a site or once across the forest over the four years. And even though it was, you can see the variability if you use the Gower's Gate site that's there. Um, I had in total 92 species, but over the seasons I recorded anywhere between 11 and 32. Lots of weeds, um, and, and what wasn't a weed, about half of those are considered capable of being um, troublesome in irrigation canals or for irrigated things. Um, and the weeds didn't seem to be, or the, the species diversity didn't seem to be related to tree density or the canopy cover either. 
I had 55 families, but only three, three major ones that um, about half of the species came from those three families. Um, every now and then when conditions allowed, you'd get the dominant species across the forest. And um, just after the flood in 1995, the Brachyscone um, basaltica was all over the western part of the forest. Anelia ocaris acuta was everywhere in the forest um, after the 1996 flood. So, um, and the 1996 flood, um, the diversity <coughs> decreased after that, but it was mainly the dry land weeds that were in the forest that disappeared at most sites. But on the Sandy Ridge sites, um, the weeds <coughs> increased. There was a high number of species at that time, probably because it was just nicely watered over that long period. The 1998 flood was in <coughs> December, I think, and it was topped up with an environmental flow. And really all it did was water the forest and let all the weeds grow. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> And I think I read a comment somewhere that people had, as you said before, that um, you just went through the forest and looked at it, and apparently people had gone through the forest and said, yes, it was nice and green. So at least I was, I, I sort of measured it a bit. So I did a hierarchy cluster analysis um, to look at similarity between sites, and this really separated it into two main groups, which I was quite pleased about. Um, the, the sites on the sand ridges and the river red gum sites and the river red gum sites were split up again between those that were in the western part of the forest and those that were close to the southern boundary of the forest. Um, Black engine lagoons right up the top end near the, near the river. And um, it looks as if elevation and probably location within the forest was determining vegetation. Um, so that was that, but it's not. And that really just gave me this broad landscape picture. I apologise for these diagrams, they're pretty complex. Um, this is the DCA analysis. To do this, I put all the species in one um, spreadsheet, all the environmental variables in the other spreadsheet, and I use things like temperature, precipitation, days of precipitation, um, number of floods, number of days of flooding, flood flow, or anything I could think about, and I used it in the same period and the preceding period because it finally dawned on me that the preceding period was just as important for germination as the current period. Um, the vectors in there are the environmental variables and the, and the length of the line shows their strength and the direction of the, the, the vector tells you which direction it's working in. And over the four years when I amalgamated all the data, you can see that it's floods, floods, floods and floods that are dominating the the vegetation but it's in the red gum forests and it's basically having a negative effect. Um, the, the, pe the period two floods that were there I think they were a small summer flood so that um, had quite a different um, impact altogether. So on this side we've got the dry sandy ridge sides and on the, uh, on the far side over there they're wet and the the factor up along the second axis seems to be disturbance as well as hydrology. So there are different hydrological issues going on. But here, location within the forest and elevation was a secondary influence. So then I thought I'd look at the weeds to see what they did. In, when I put all the species in together, there was no grouping of the species. This analysis is usually used to look at groupings of species. I had a continuous spread of species across the whole space, which really says that the forest is changing all the time, the vegetation is just changing. But the weeds were actually forming um, groups within that, a bit more specific in their needs. And by looking at, at what weeds were actually in, within each group, I could start to look at maybe what they were responding to. And, and this information could probably be used for the native species that are there as well, and saying, well, these have probably got the same either characteristics or the same need, environmental needs as the weeds. Um, and then I decided that I would look at the seasonal data. I was never going to look at the seasonal data, and I'm a bit 
sorry that I started to look at it, I put <laughs> all the seasonal data from all my sites into a DCA analysis with all of the environmental variables and nothing happened. And I went, ooh. And then it dawned on me that every site was probably responding differently and all of these different um, interactions were cancelling themselves out and that I was going to have to look at each site individually. So this is the site at Gower's Gate. Um, and as you can see, um, the forest is changing by the... I was going to join up all the seasonal um, parts so that you could see how the forest was changing at each season, but the diagram just got too complex. Um, but if you start to follow it from about September 1995, you'll see it, it moves up and down, across and back and down and up, and it's just moving the whole time. So there's constant change across the forest. Um, on this side it's wet, um, up the top it's dry, the other side it's more species that are drier. And quite a few of the, the species down in here, should use this, shouldn't I? Where am I? Sorry. In here we have as we have Azola, Cochula, Australis, um, Ludwigia, um, and quite a few of the, the species that um, you would expect from seasonal flooding, or, or that need quite a lot of flooding. Um, what wasn't there was um, the moira grass, that is actually up in the in the top right hand quadrat. So then I decided that. Um, some of the, the interpretation didn't quite, didn't quite fit and maybe there was something to do with nutrients in the forest in here. So I went off and got the nutrient data, water quality river data that I could get. Um, it's pretty rough and robust because some of it's daily, some of it's monthly, some of it's seasonal when you take it off the, the, the data warehouse site. Um, not every site has been has been monitored, so I took it from my survey periods um, from any site I could possibly get. And one of the things that happened with this was that I could then see the impact of different catchments on the vegetation here in Barma. So this is it, and you can see that um, things like Azola and where, where they needed a lot of flood water before, they're now also responding in a positive way to nutrients in the floodwaters. Um, the Moira grass was responding to um, increased phosphorus levels along axis too. So that there's quite a lot of um, the nutrients that are coming down in the river water are having an impact on the vegetation in the forest, which just adds another complicating factor. So this is a regional impact that you have that's going to be difficult to to manage. And it, I'm not quite sure, I also, Broken Creek seems to be monitored very well and it had quite a big impact on the vegetation at every site and I'm not quite sure about this, whether it's um, a groundwater impact or not. Um, I'm not. I don't quite know what to do with that one. Okay, so if we go and, I won't show you all these diagrams, but if we go to Tongalong Ridge, outside the, the fence where grazing occurs, I didn't get very many environmental indicators that were strong that were act acting along that first axis and they should be the primary ones that are running the, the vegetation um, and it was, um, and, and they were quite weak, you know, and they were acting way, way down, there's sort of third level influences on the vegetation. But inside the fence um, at Tongalong Ridge, it was flood characteristics that are driving it in a primary way, and maybe Tongalong Creek's been quite close by as having some impact on that, maybe through groundwater or aquifers or something underneath the vegetation <coughs> in there. And if we go to Hutt Lake, um, again, the, I had the same, um, for all the river flow data and, um, and climate data that I had, huh, Again, there was not very much on the first two axes, but when I looked at the, the nutrients, the nutrient levels in the river water are having a very strong impact on, on hut-like vegetation. 
And if you just look at some of the weeds and do just simple correlations, every site is responding differently to each stimulus. Um, the slopes might be different, the directions are different. Um, sometimes the relationship's stronger than others, but they're all different. <coughs> Um, so this is just in summary, I just found, as everybody else has found, um, the, the forest understory is very complex and it's very variable um, and it changes at a site seasonally, um, changes between sites seasonally um, and the influences on the vegetation at the site are different and they have different strengths as well. Um, so I. I can show that there's this really long-term landscape scale um, influence of flooding on the forest and, and water is the most important thing overall for the forest, but at the local scale there are a lot of other um, environmental variables um, pushing the vegetation or having a control on the vegetation. And the environmental vectors themselves are very complex, they often um, act in two or even three directions. Um, as well. So, sorry about the complexity of the forest, but we've all been talking about it <laughs> today. Okay. Um, the reference areas and the, and the cattle exclusion sites didn't group together at all. So, um, people like Robertson have suggested that um, the vegetation does take quite a long time to recover after cattle, and maybe that's the, the case here as well, unless the results here are just showing up that cattle do actually get into these areas occasionally and something's happening. So, so in summary, that it's very complex forest. There's a lot of disturbance in the forest and maybe that, that disturbance has been going on for so long that the whole forest understory has adapted to that disturbance now and so you don't show anything up high exotics as you find in other places and as Keith has suggested about too. Um, the stock response was quite weak but it was very complex and I think that's because I really only had um, total stock numbers for the forest or total all stock numbers for the western part of the forest and the eastern part of the forest and really rough and I, they were the only um, stock criteria that I used but they were still having some impact although not, not as much as I thought they would. Um, okay, so I, um, this just adds to the management problems and, I, and after the 1996 flood I thought well maybe flooding is one way to um, control the weedy species in, in Palma Forest as well, which other people have talked about <coughs> too. Um, and I couldn't have done this project with the help from a lot of people. And I've also realised that the Atkinson family had gave me access to the land as well, so I should thank them as well. <laughs>